Yep, so we have John Burnham talking about formality. Hello, everyone. I'm John, uh, and I'm working on a proof language with uh, my co-founder, Victor Maya. Um, so I just want to do a quick refresher on what a proof language is and what type systems are. Um, so uh, so here's, here's some pseudocode uh, that represents um, uh, an array indexing function. Can everyone see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is, represents an array indexing function uh, in an untyped language. So you have uh, an array of you know, numbers or whatever, and uh, you have an index, and you want to get the element in the array at that index. Uh, and so get one is bar because uh, array indices start at zero, um, and get two is bas. So these are strings. You apply, apply get, and you get the, what's the thing that's in the array. Um, so uh, here's a riddle. Uh, if get one is bar and get two is baz, uh, what's get 1.5? Uh, better question, what should get 1.5 be? Runtime error, because... Compile time error. Well, <laughs> in an untyped language, it'll be a runtime error. Um, indexing an array with, uh, with something that's not an integer uh, makes no sense, but in an, in an untyped language, uh, you can shoot yourself in the foot, you, there are no checks, and uh, make, you can make a bad call, and this only fails during execution when your code is running um, and can affect the world around it. Um, runtime errors are tough uh, because sometimes they do nothing and sometimes they cause your spacecraft to perform rapid unscheduled disassembly. Um, your code's runtime could be in five minutes, it could be in 30 years, it could be on your laptop, it could be on devices that haven't even been built yet. You have no idea. It's runtime, it's totally unconstrained, there are, anything could happen. So. By adding uh, some types, we can get the compiler to complain, um, hey, fix your code. Uh, you can't have an index that's not an integer. So here we've added an int type to our index, and now if we try to call 1.5, 1.5 is not an integer, and so we get a type error. Um, this, this looks pretty similar to the last error, but there's a very important difference, which is that this error occurs before your code runs. This error, this error occurs uh, when you're writing your code when you're, you're, you're trying to compile your code to some um, executable representation. And therefore, it occurs before your code can do any damage. Um, but this is really inflexible um, because this only works for integer arrays because you see the return type is, uh, is an integer. So uh, if we wanted different array contents, uh, you'd, we'd have to copy paste boilerplate. So we could have arrays containing integers, uh, characters, strings, objects, whatever. But we would need different functions because simple types um, concretize the contents of the of the array, and there are languages like this, um, and that, that 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 try to abstract over this boilerplate pattern with things like interfaces. Um, but there's a much better way to do that, and that's uh, polymorphism. Um, so polymorphism in, in Greek just means many many um, many forms or many types. And so here we have type level variables that um, can get filled with whatever the contents of the array are. So we have an array with type a, and it returns type A. So, you know, A for A replace int or string or whatever you want. So this is a really useful abstraction. Um, languages like Rust uh, and Haskell have this, um, but most type languages uh, stop at uh, polymorphism um, at, uh, as their, you know, type level expressivity. Um, but it's still, but this doesn't re prevent runtime errors. Um, because if we can, if we call get with um, with an array that's uh, that's smaller than the index, so we, we have like a really big index here, 9001, um, and our array is only three elements long, and so um, we're going to get an out of bounds runtime um, index uh, error. Um, and um, you know some languages will runtime error, other languages uh, will dump the contents of memory um, at uh, so like in C because arrays are just contiguous blocks of memory. If you do an out-of-bounds error, um, you might just you know, get whatever's in the, you know, the next block of memory, which is really, really bad and has caused a lot of people a lot of pain over you know, the past several decades. Um, so we want our compiler to, uh, to warn us if our, um, if our index is bigger than our array length. And so to do that, we're going to need to tell the compiler at, um, at the type level um, what the length of the array is. So we're going to need a type that depends uh, not just on other types, like polymorphism, but we need a type that depends on normal values. So uh, here we add a type level number n that tells the compiler 
um, how long the array is. Uh, and just like we have a uh, type parameter uh, A that tells us what's in the array, uh, N is a value that lets us enforce that our index has to be between 0 and N minus 1. So, um, so again, we get a type error, and when we write our code, we, we get a, a failure before it actually goes out into the world and you know, does horrible things to people. Um, so uh, the, what's cool about this is that the values in dependent types um, can be the results of computations, not um, just constants. Um, and so one way to think about it is that uh, compile time is, is the runtime of your compiler. So compile time can do any, any type of computation. And so um, if you just have, uh, if you, instead of just a, uh, a value n, you, you could have um, some um, computation on um, on n or on your your uh, the things that you know about at the type level. So um, this lets us constrain functions um, a lot. So uh, so much so that we can um, force there to be only one or, um, or only maybe a very small number of valid implementations. So in this case, uh, we can um, you know for this for this function we have um, a, a number n. Uh, a function of n that returns um, some uh, array of prime numbers such that the product of those prime numbers equals the number that we that we um, input. Um, and so we can play a little game, it's sort of like uh, who's that Pokemon, but with types. Who's that function? So um, here, there's only one valid implementation of this. Factorize, right? Because if uh, you have a number and you decompose it into primes, right? Um, now, I mean, there's, you, it, this doesn't constrain the order that those numbers have to appear in, and maybe you want that, but it, uh, it does mean that, you know, it, that, the, uh, that the, um, the, uh, the elements of that array are going to be the, the, the factors of the, uh, of the number. Um, so if you tried to, you know, I don't know, do like the Fibonacci sequence, it would fail because, you know, there, you, wouldn't, you would have non-primes and, and they wouldn't multiply together to equal the number. So uh, here's, we can play the, the, the game again. And this is a, a function that um, takes an array of integers that is um, n, uh, uh, that has length n, and returns an array of integers of the same length with the same elements, such that, um, that uh, the elements now are in uh, ascending order. Um, so for, for um, any i between 1 and n, the, um, uh, every uh, element is greater than the one preceding it in the array. Um, and so this function has to be a sort function. Um, because if you take an array and you turn it into an array with the elements in ascending order, then you've sorted the array. Um, so this, this, you know, this is checked statically in a dependently typed language, um, and uh, that means um, your uh, you will not go to space today problems become my code is broken and I don't, and I don't know why problems, which is much better because that kind, that kind of problem is addressable by you the programmer when you're, um, when you're at your desk, when you're writing your code. And so you, know, you don't get a phone call at three in the morning, hey, this is broken, you know, please fix this. Um, this is especially nice um, for uh, things like blockchains uh, where uh, your, your uh, function deploys to an immutable platform, and so changing it might be actually impossible. Okay, so um, so this is uh, uh, basically the uh, dependent, this is dependent types, and dependent types are really useful because of this thing called the Curry-Howard isomorphism, which essentially says that there's a structural correspondence between um, uh, programs um, in uh, a type language and, um, and theorems, and here we've extended it a little bit because, you know, the, Imports are kind of like citations, and files are kind of like papers, um, a little bit. So there's a, you know, maybe an extended structural, uh, you know, correspondence. Um, but uh, but this is a really cool result, and there's this is used a lot in dependent languages, uh, dependently typed languages like you know like Agda, uh, Coq, uh, Idris, and um, but it's kind of underutilized um, on you know on the software side because not a lot of people program independently typed languages. And it's kind of underutilized, I, you know, I think, on the mathematics side, because a lot of mathematics, you know, is done, you know, manually, you know, you're writing, you know, LaTeX and, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, and so I, uh, we're really interested in trying to see, okay, if we, if we have this, you know, isomorphism between 
mathematics and programming, shouldn't we have some tools that are like allow that allow um, uh, you know programmers and mathematicians to um, to collaborate in a single language? Um, so um, so that's basically the goal with formality. We want to make a useful programming language for practical uh, software and a useful language for exploring uh, mathematics. Maybe it's not going to be the best proof language out there, maybe it's not going to be the best programming language out there, but it's going to be the best uh, language for doing uh, a combination of practical software and, um, you know, and uh, proofs. So, um, so we've got a long way to reach that goal. Yeah. So I was just going to ask about that point, actually, because you know, proofs are programmed as a little simplistic uh, mathematicians don't usually care about the proofs in the same way that programmers care about their programs. Um, sure. Uh, so, the um, so well the thing the thing though is I don't know. There's a really interesting like proof of relevance, for example. Maybe you don't care why something is true, only that it is. Right. So so I mean that gets into that gets into the question of like whether you care about um, proofs uh, that are constructive or like whether you care about proofs. So there's there is I mean, like what's formality's take on it? Uh, we're, we're absolutely, you know, constructivist, one hundred percent. You know, okay. so you know, you can you can model informality, non-constructive proofs like I don't know the law of the excluded middle, right? And uh, but um, but proofs as programs, um, generally, like to have proofs that are like executable as programs, they have to be constructive. So this is, uh, and that gets into like the, the like a really philosophical you question. You want proofs to be able to. Yeah, well, because if, if you have proofs as programs, um, you you have the ability to um, you know to to run them, and that's sometimes you know something that is you know desirable. Yeah, um, I mean, but still, even with n with non like constructive proofs, you can still model non constructive proofs in a constructive language. You just have to you introduce axioms essentially, and so now you have functions that can never be called, but they can still be type checked. So so it's still like it's still useful for that, and I mean, I could, uh, I could, you know, show my. Uh, I have a whole bunch of, of you know, logic proofs, uh, like you know. Yeah, that's fine. I'm but just okay. Curious about your ethos. Yeah. Well, so so we really follow, you know, intuition, intuitionistic uh, type theory. You really theory. mean that slide then? What? You really mean isomorphism there? That's yeah. Like that. gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so so our our goal with formality is we you know we want to build a language that's you know safe, fast, uh, simple, and portable. Um, some of you know some of those things are really important for for you know practical software and a lot of proof languages. You know, it's not they don't prioritize um, you know particularly uh, fast, simple, or portable. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you want to get programmers to adopt something, it's it's got to be you know fast. Um, so okay, so here are all the type signatures that we went over from that you know brief introduction to dependent types, but in formalities, syntax, um, these are just the types, not the implementations, um, but it's basically the same as the pseudocode, uh, and I think that it's, uh, you know, more, should be more or less uh, legible, um, you know, uh, but, yeah, okay. So, here's a more formal presentation uh, of, like, the, the, the syntax and comparing it to, you know, JavaScript or Agda, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, so we, we have, uh, you know, basically anything that's, that's expressible in, in uh, JavaScript, you know, we have like corresponding syntax for, I mean, there are some changes, there's some restrictions in, in formality that I'll get to in a second, but yeah, okay. Um, what so the, What are the proofs that correspond to these new things that, for example, are not in Acta? Um, which, which one? It's so, so like a box, new, use. Etc. So boxes are are, are, are in Agda. So, um, so, so new, use, and self. I those those are all. So use is pretty simple. That's just erasing um, uh, type level information, which you can't do in uh, the, uh, You can't manually. Well, you can, but it's it, it requires like like a different. I mean, does this mean you have like a new logic now? That is yes. The, so okay. so it, we use a, a different theory than than Agda. So we have we have a, a you know. So I have some slides on that in a second. Um, okay, so uh, so but that's actually directly relevant to how we do data types because everything that like the way that we've designed our theory um, is basically uh, to try to answer the question. Okay, so languages like Agda or Coq are really um, powerful, but are very complicated because they use the calculus of inductive constructions, and so having um, so. 
basically what they what they do is they say, okay, we have calculus of constructions, but calculus of constructions is is weak in the sense of you can't. There's a lot of stuff you can't prove because you don't have in, you don't have induction. Um, so uh, we have uh, data types that look very much like you know what you would do in you know Agda or Cock or Haskell or you know. And so here we have we have um, lists and uh, this is how we take the tail of a list. But this is just a syntax sugar. Um, and so this is obviously very ugly and more complicated, but um, uh, you know visually. But in terms of theory, this is actually much simpler because what um, is going on here is is we've in, we encode data types as um, as uh, uh, as lambdas. So using this uh, primitive called uh, self types. So a self type um, lets you take a um, take the term that is being typed and lift it to the type level. So, um, and what that lets us do is it lets us take something like list and it lets, it lets us encode list as, as the elimination of list. So, um, so, uh, so bool, for example, um, uh, is just, uh, you know, bool is just true and false. And um, then uh, if you look at the, the case of, Right? So case of is a Boolean, a proposition over a Boolean, and then uh, the, the, a true and false case for, for, for that proposition. Um, and then it returns that proposition over whatever the initial Boolean is. So it, you take a bool and you turn it into something else. And so that's, you know, that's a... So this is clearly not like what you do that encode algebraic data types and say system f with those kinds of lambdas, right? No, like no. So so uh, in system, f, I mean system f doesn't have built-in data types. But I think you can put like nat in there, right? But you lose your induction principle. Right. You so said encode is lambda, so I immediately started thinking. Right. Like that. So but um, so but these these are uh, lambda expressions, right? And they 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 just at the type level they. Um, they're typed with this, this self-type um, uh, primitive. Um, so if you look at case of versus the definition of bool, they're exactly the same. It's just instead of, you know, case of taking a Boolean, the, the bool type um, takes the term that the type is typing. And so, and then for, for true and false, you get the standard lambda encoding for, for true and false, which is, you know, you take two things and you, you know, throw either the first or the second one away. And, um, and this isn't just isorecursive types. This isn't what? Isorecursive types. I, I don't know. What's an isorecursive? This is where you, you have, um, so this is from non-dependent type theory where you have like an in and an out for an F algebra, say, and there's like a... No, I don't. Okay. Uh, so um, let's, let's see. Okay, so kinds of <coughs> instructions, right? So we have, um, you know, start, we start with simply typed um, uh, lambda calculus terms can depend on terms. And then on each axis, we add another um, ability for, for uh, you know, um, uh, things to depend on other things. So all the way at the top, the calculus of, so we have terms that can depend on types in second order lambda calculus and then in system uh, F omega, types can depend on types and then lambda P types depend on, on, uh, on terms. And then finally, we have calculus of construction, which is basically what you know, every proof language is based on. And we use the calculus of constructions. Um, but, so here's uh, three sort of different options for doing inductive data types. So calculus uh, of inductive constructions, COIC, is like the standard, this is the most developed, like pretty much every like, you know, um, mature proof language uses this. And what that does is that it says, okay, we'll take the calculus of constructions and we'll add these primitives. So we'll add like a so we'll take like, you know, like for bool and list, we'll take a, a primitive that lets us make this thing. But it's very complicated to do this and it adds, you know, if you can do calculus of constructions in, I don't know, 500 lines of code, it might take, you know, several thousand to implement, you know, inductive data types as a primitive. Um, and so um, there's, uh, there was another, uh, there's uh, the other two options that we've looked at. These are both by, uh, this is both research, uh, so is, uh, CDLE and System S, uh, both of which um, were uh, created uh, or you know developed by one of our advisors, Aaron Stump at the University of Iowa. Um, these let you form uh, inductive data types um, out of more primitive structures, and so um, 
the so CDLE is the basis for the proof language. Uh, CDL is de uses dependent uh, lambda eliminations, which I won't get into because it's complicated. But there's another so there's another one which is System S. Uh, there's a really nice paper on um, and um, it adds the self type primitive and shows that you can you can create data types and create a consistent um, and sound strongly normalizing uh, you know system um, using uh, using self types. So. Okay. To, to summarize, you're using self types as an implementation technique for inductive structures yes. and type theory that doesn't have it, so that you can get induction principles. Inside. Right, and so we can we can keep our theory simple, um, and uh, yeah, that's, and so like our like total our implementation is about two thousand lines of code of and two thousand lines of JavaScript. So like if we, yeah, uh, that's that's a whole story of why we we, you know. We, we chose JavaScript, it's, it, mostly because like we wanted it to be portable, right? And JavaScript is, you know, everyone has a JavaScript interpreter installed on their device. So it's, if we have a JavaScript implementation, you know, it's really easy for us to ship, um, which is, you know, important to us uh, since we're trying to build practical things. Okay, so more stuff about, about data types. So our data types, you know, we can do uh, recursive fields, we can do mutual recursion, so, you know, natural numbers and then foo and bar refer to each other. That works perfectly well. Um, and we can even do negative occurrences, which is really cool because like in um, languages like, like Agda, there's like, this is a really complicated, like negative occurrences, you know, can really mess, mess you up. And so you have to like do, there are a whole bunch of like checks in the compiler for is this allowed or is this not allowed. Um, this is what I was getting at with the ISO recursive types. Yeah. The two allow you to do this when you're in a general recursive setting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, um, and so we can add type indexing to, to these types. And so this uh, is even type is a type that is only constructible with um, even numbers. Word is our native uh, number type um, for, you know, reasons. Um, but yeah, so, um, so like uh, even zero, uh, even two, even four, but you, you would not be able to construct uh, even three um, because that would be a type error because the type the index um, would uh, uh, would uh, would fit like you wouldn't be able to to, to create a a, um, a half right um, so uh, so if you if you try would try if you try to do like div two right uh, on three like the x is even would fail so this is even type is that is now a constructive proof that a number is even which is kind of kind of cool. Um, and so we can do, uh, you know, the standard, uh, you know, uh, empty type, which, uh, and then an absurd function. Um, so empty is the uninhabited type, um, and it has no constructors. Um, and from, uh, from empty, we can prove any proposition. And we can use that to show, in the case of, you know, true isn't false, that um, we can, uh, you know, do a rewrite and show that, you know, that that's uninhabited, that so there's no term that creates a true is a true is equal to false proof um, and then we can use that to show that um, if we tried to do like a, a, a case expression on true that the false case of you know of true is uh, impossible to uh, to reach so we can use absurd to you know to mark unreachable code um, which is kind of nice um, so formality uh, is a terminating language <coughs> um, for you know reasons that I will describe more in uh, just a minute, but um, the um, but the way that this works is that so it, we have this uh, this the, this termination is enforced um, by the um, uh, so if if this so the first the first uh, the untypable loop um, this is an infinite loop so, but this is this uh, formality will complain about this and it'll throw it. Even, even in like the um, the untyped core language, it'll complain and says, and it'll say you're not allowed to do this because we have this uh, we have something called the stratif like a stratification condition that um, means that you're not allowed to move um, uh, variables between um, layers of boxes. Um, so we have this ability to duplicate uh, variables, um, uh, and so what the the um, uh, result is that like even though we have a terminating language we can still um, you know do useful things like apply like a function you know some set number of times even if we can't you know create like 
an infinite loop or like do like the Y Combinator or, or like, you know, do fixed points. Um, uh, and so recursion, right, is kind of interesting in a terminating language. So we can do uh, bounded recursion. So um, what uh, this syntax is, so this is a whole bunch of syntax sugar, um, but basically we take a, um, uh, a step function and, uh, and a, a church number um, so this, this capital N is a church number, and we fold the step function over the church number, and then we have a halt case if that church number um, is, um, uh, isn't big enough, right, to, so, so if you, if you the, this example of factorial um, is uh, we uh, call a function with 100 recursive calls, but we're calling it on 12, so 12 factorial is only going to take 12 recursive calls, so we can actually compute this. If we called it with, you know, tried to call it with the church number of 11, we would halt and return zero. Um, so it would return the wrong result, which is, which is a problem because this like, means that your code can still do unexpected things. Um, but we have, a, we have a solution for that, and that, um, that's structural recursion. I'm going to go back to the, is it this practical slide. So, so it's like yeah. Ethereum's gas or something? Yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it's like gas for recursive functions. So um, the problem with, uh, with doing this is like you have to provide a term for the halt case. Um, and what we discovered is that we can um, implement using just the primitives that you know, I, I've talked about so far with you know, um, you know, data types uh, absurd and um, uh, you know, uh, pat case pattern matching. Um, we can implement something that's basically the same as structural recursion in uh, Agda, for example. Um, which is essentially a proof that this, so this is a lot of complicated code, but what's, what's going on in, in, um, in practice is we're proving that at every iteration of the step function, the, um, the, the church number is sufficient, is bigger than the bound of, um, uh, than some bound, right? So here we have a bound type that, that is restricting the natural number that this, uh, um, you know, the natural number n to be smaller than, than, than the number of recursive calls. And so if we have this proof, right, that, th that we're, we're, we have a natural number and we have our sort of our fuel, right, for the number of recursive calls, and if that natural number is always smaller than the fuel, then we're creating a proof that we have enough fuel at every step to complete our computation. And that, so, so our, um, our halt case becomes empty, becomes an, an absurdity, and we can return something that's well typed, even though we're not constructing any, any you know, there's no, we're, we're proving that that, that that halt case is itself unreachable. Okay, so the question is, uh, is this practical? And uh, I think yes, because um, like uh, this, you know, this factorial call is, uh, you know, calling it with, you know, a church number 2 to the 256. Um, that's, that's bigger than, um, you know, than, that's like this, the same as all the, the, as the number of atoms in the observable universe. So this will never terminate. You can't build a computer that, you know, that does this many recursive calls. Um, and all physical computers are just, um, they're finite state machines. They, you can't actually build something that does something, that's, that does non-termination, that performs a non-terminating computation. Something you, you will be bounded in space or you'll be bounded in time. Everything is a finite state machine. And so if everything is in reality a finite state machine, then th there's this, it introduces this possibility of saying, okay, well, why don't we restrict our theory to more closely match the actual hardware we're running stuff over, and maybe that restriction will uh, pay some dividends in our theory being simpler because we don't have to deal with non-termination because, uh, and, uh, and, you know, maybe that'll make the runtime a little bit more complicated because now we have to, introduce um, this idea of, of um, you know, the boundedness of our computation all, all over the place, but <clears throat> maybe that's a good trade-off in certain circumstances. So, okay, so specifically for us, like, what this trade-off allows is it allows us to um, have, uh, is this going to play? There we go, okay. Um, it, uh, the, the trade-off of making the language terminating lets us do all of the, you know, the, that, complex type level dependent type machinery um, on a uh, very um, fast and uh, efficient uh, runtime um, called interaction nets that um, has been, you know, studied a lot, but has kind of been abandoned by, um, 
uh, sort of you know people who study this stuff because previous implementations had the problem where if you tried to you know do you know uh, model non-terminating um, lambda expressions for example in an interaction net you get um, you know some things that diverge in, in uh, uh, lambda expressions that diverge if you run them on an interaction net with a with a simple model um, which this this reduction is illustrating sort of a simple translation between interaction nets and and, and uh, lambda expressions, um, you get the wrong result. So uh, probably the, the best classic implementation of, of interaction nets is called the Bologna Optimal Higher Order Machine. And it's pretty cool, it, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not very, it's not really a, an improvement over other kinds of models because uh, there's a lot of bookkeeping involved, keeping track of terms that might diverge. Um, you say you get the wrong result or just one that's not as fastly computed? Um, so if you try to do a naive translation, like a very simple translation between lambda terms and interaction nets. Um, there are divergent lambda terms um, that will converge in the interaction nets, which is, you know, not good. So, so this this model, even though it has some really nice properties, like optimal sharing, runtime fusion, it's compatible with you know the lamp lamping optimal beta reduction, um, has kind of you know not been very well developed because people have been trying to run the lambda calculus on it. And so what, what we, you know, uh, had the uh, idea to do is um, if we restrict ourselves to a terminating language, all those problems with interaction nets go away. And so we have this possibility to like take advantage of these really nice properties, um, like being able to run this in parallel because it's, you know, it's, it's a graph reduction uh, uh, model. Um, so same kinds of, you know, Parallelism that you can get like in other graph models like the Haskell STG machine, um, and in fact even even better in some cases because you can you know uh, you can do the the sharing between different parts of your graph uh, more um, powerfully. So uh, so this is what it looks like. It's uh, you know we have uh, six different node types and then um, a whole bunch of different reduction rules. And so this is a graph. These are graph rewrite rules where um, you take you take the thing on on the left and it turns into the thing on the right. Um, and uh, yeah, and so we have uh, uh, the the six node types. Um, actually, the the last four aren't uh, really necessary in uh, to the, like the expressive power of the system. Those are only there so that we can make use of uh, the fact that most practical computing devices have native uh, n uh, numerics and native numeric functions that run really fast. Um, we could do the same thing. We could, you know, do numer numeric computation with just er um, uh, eraser nodes and constructor nodes, just the first two, but everything would be modeled as, as um, computation on church numbers, and that's very slow. Um, so, so for, for, you know, for the sake of practicality, we, we wanted, you know, fast numbers. Um, this is how um, the, uh, the formality language uh, turns into interaction nets. Um, essentially, there are, th there are uh, three languages, roughly speaking. There's the typed language, which is what I was showing you earlier, um, and then that gets type erased to the formality core, which is a core language, which is what um, is sort of described on the left-hand side of this. Um, uh, and the types, the types are, are um, uh, Curry-style types, so they're not um, intrinsic to the, the, the terms. They're, they act as... as um, like compiler compile time annotations, and so, um, which is you know, kind of interesting. Um, so where does so, self end up here? What? Where does the self type kind of? Yeah. So the self here? the self types uh, get erased uh, before.